Good morning, and welcome to Taurus Railroad Connections, more important than ever. As the, pandem the pandemic continues to paralyze the world, and most importantly, the tourist railroad industry, more than ever, meaningful conversations are important. None of us have the right answers on how to navigate these uncharted waters. No one has ever dreamed the scenarios that we now face. We're all working in the dark, using our gut instincts to make decisions and trying to keep our organizations afloat. Our goal today with this webinar is to start a conversation within our small community. We would like to encourage your participation in today's conversation. On your screen, you should have a dialog box entitled Go to Webinar Control Panel. And within that box, there should be two sections. If you look at the bottom section, you should notice a gray bar labeled questions. And just below that, another white box with the words type questions here. Simply type in your questions there and hit either enter or click on the send button and those questions will come to us. I'd now like to introduce my co-host, Josh Miller, station manager from the North Shore Scenic Railroad. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I think this is going to be a, a good discussion that we'll have here over the next hour or so. Um, as Mike mentioned, I'm the station manager for the North Shore Scenic Railroad in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and so we operate excursions between Duluth and Two Harbors, which is on the North Shore of Lake Superior. Um, and uh, we're owned and operated by the Lake Superior Railroad Museum. So same building, Lake Superior Railroad Museum and North Shore Scenic Railroad are one and the same. And um, I work for the operating railroad. However, the museum is the parent company. And so we're, again, one and the same. And uh, we're currently uh, shut down in the sense that we have three or four um, main full-timer staff, a couple cleaners that and shop guys who are kind of keeping things alive and going, um, again, with that transportation aspect, because we haul freight car and store freight cars on the line. So that's where, where we're at in the world um, right now, and then approaching, of course, the summer season, just like everybody else here. Um, we have uh, some very distinguished panelists here to, uh, with us today, and um, I'm really excited to have these guys on the line. They bring a lot of experience to um, the railroad uh, industry, the railroad excursion industry, and uh, I think we'll have some good insights for everyone. Um, the attendee list that Mike has put together here um, and the people that are, uh, are registered to be watching, we really represent this entire country from sea to shining sea in the sense that uh, I think it's, it's exciting to have other people out there doing the same jobs or similar jobs and businesses as uh, we are. And the goal of this, as Mike mentioned, is to bring all of this together um, and start having the same conversation so we're not all having to reinvent the wheel on our own. Um, we don't uh, have the all the answers. I don't think anybody uh, is claiming to be the expert here, but we'll hopefully provide you, the viewer, some uh, insight into um, what other railroads are doing and help start pondering things of how to adapt some ideas uh, towards you. So we'll hopefully start this uh, this series off here very well. Um, to introduce the panelists here, we have Nathaniel Guest, who is the Executive Director of the Colebrook Railroad and Preservation Trust, along with Mark Graybill, who is the President and GM of the Historic Rail Adventures Operators of the Georgetown Loop in Colorado. So we have Pennsylvania and Colorado represented here, along with Duluth in the center. And of course, Mike at Dynamic Ticketing um, has also uh, got a unique insight into the railroad world because he talks to many of us. Um, so uh, we have a little agenda figured out. We do not anticipate getting through our entire agenda today, and that's kind of by design because uh, we hope to continue this conversation uh, throughout the week and at the same time uh, really respect everybody's time to make this one hour that we have um, as uh, precise and valuable as possible so you can get something out of it but still get on with your day a little later and then um, leave it as it to be continued hopefully after that but let's quick talk about what we're going to try to cover here and that is um, talking about the shutdown and how most of us are all restricted I think all of us are restricted and, and closed down to the essentials um, and where we're at how far out uh, are, are your trains canceled or how far out should they be canceled that's a discussion point um, how long until we can start up again uh, one concept is what if the all clear was given tomorrow Coronavirus is gone and everybody's free. If that were to happen, 
how do you gauge when things will start up again, both from a mechanical and maintenance standpoint at your railroad, but also uh, from a audience perspective, which leads right into our next uh, item on the agenda is building brand awareness, um, how to do that in the meantime, leading up to a potential um, um, back to normal, all clear. And uh, what are you doing to uh, protect your staff, volunteers, and crews uh, as we go into what is potentially a whole new world? And then um, we'll do a little question and answer session um, and then wrap things up and discuss next time. So again, I want to reintroduce my uh, panelists here. We'll give them a second to kind of introduce themselves and then we'll get on to our first uh, discussion question point. Uh, we'll start with Mark Graybill here out in uh, the Georgetown Loop in Colorado. Mark, welcome. Thanks very much, Josh, and welcome everyone. And just a, a little bit about our operation. We are a little less than an hour from Denver, so you can make it from state capital to Georgetown in about 50 minutes on most days. So we're fortunate to be close to a major population point. Um, last year, we had just shy of 200,000 rioters, and that that obviously is a a big factor the ridership that we've had last year versus what we're going to have this year we are currently shut down on march 17th we laid everybody off except our hr person and our finance person and they take they took a wage cut colorado is one of the first states i think that's that's starting to loosen some of the restrictions so we are um, planning on starting some shop work and track work and also some ticketing work starting on May 4th. So we are, and at this point we are, we still have May 22nd as our opening day, but that is to be determined because we're still under the phase one restrictions. That's kind of where we're at at the moment. Alrighty, well, thank you, Mark. And we'll come back to you with, uh, in just a few minutes here, but Nathaniel, wanna tell us a little bit about uh, yourself there? Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, pleased to participate in this discussion. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so our railroad is sort of at the other end of the spectrum from, from Mark's. We're a much smaller operation, uh, both in terms of the number of passengers we serve and then also the, the number of employees we have. Uh, we haven't laid anyone off uh, so far. Uh, what we've done is move all of our operating folks over to uh, capital projects that we're able to continue, which are smaller in number than we would have been able under the, uh, without the restrictions that have been put in place for staying at home, so on and so forth. But one of the saving graces for us is that we haul freight. Uh, and so that being deemed an essential service, uh, employees that we would have had working either in passenger operations or in uh, certain other capital projects unrelated to freight have been moved over to uh, the freight side, both to handle the freight. And we're also doing some track work deemed necessary to be able to, to do that freight. So we've been able to keep everyone busy and to pay them out of funds that we had for, for capital projects. We've also um, made use of some of the federal stimulus uh, opportunities, both through the payroll protection program and the economic injury disaster loan program. Um, so from a operations and fiscal standpoint, though we're, we've reduced our scope of what we're doing, we, we have some something closer to normalcy, though I won't, I use that word very guardedly and reluctantly, uh, up until, you know, probably sometime in June. Uh, and then uh, we're going to need to figure out what to do from there. Um, our operations, uh, just as Mark said, uh, for, for Georgetown Loop are also curtailed. We're not running any passenger trains. Uh, we don't have anything planned to run, um, at least for the first part of May. Um, and the, the spooling up process is going to be um, uh, a complicated one on two fronts, both bringing back our employees who are, uh, who are now doing other activities over into the operational side, the passenger operation. Our passenger operation is also largely volunteer based. Uh, and so we'll be needing to train and indoctrinate our volunteers into um, safe and uh, pra safe practices uh, that we can go into later. Uh, and then also we need to determine how we're going to train our passengers, what our expectations are going to be of our passengers to protect their own safety and the safety of fellow passengers. So um, it's going to be an interesting uh, and, and trailblazing 30 days. 
Sure is. Um, well, thank you very much and welcome, Nathaniel. Um, <clears throat> for those of you just joining us, we have a panel here of uh, four of us um, to discuss the uh, potential future of the next few months in the, the tourist railroad world and excursion railroad world, heritage railroad, um, and put together here by Mike Kuehl, and we welcome you all to it. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, we have some pre-prepared questions just to get our discussion going, but I want to remind everybody who's watching that you have a chat window there um, and a question window. Is it a question window or the chat window, Mike? Uh, the question window. Question window. window. Question mm -hmm. window, okay. So uh, just a reminder there, and see somebody already left us a question. So you can write in questions and comments, and then we are going to review those and kind of work them into the conversation so we can keep this moving along here. And so that way it, uh, uh, everybody can participate. But we're going to start things off with a question about, um, let's hypothesize about when the all clear is given. Let's just assume for a second that someday this is all going to come to an end. You know, as it is now, I think most of us are following along with our government uh, in terms of the governors and um, um, state by state as to when we can potentially operate. And assuming that an all clear is given, because most of us have a date that it's just leading up to, and then in theory that just reopens things. Um, what is the potential market out there is what we're going to talk about of people, of uh, guest passengers and excursion uh, visitors, tourists. Um, what is that market going to be like going forward? And I'm going to start the questions off with uh, Nathaniel and Mark. Feel free to jump in anytime. Okay. Nathaniel, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll give, it, give it a go. Um, so I've, I've been casually paying attention to what's happened in other parts of the world when the equivalent of an all clear whatever that looks like is given uh, and some places there's been what I would describe as the release of pent-up demand uh, and and passengers or I use the word passengers tourists visitors uh, the, the number of them explodes but what I haven't been able to, to get a good gauge on is um, is that is that function different in a place that's a national park with people out doing outdoor recreation um, or where they're more uh, separated uh, and, and free to move about apart from each other to, to socially distance more readily um, than they would be able to do in an 800 square foot passenger car. Um, so I think there's, you know, as, as we're approaching it at the Colebrookdale, I think that there's uh, reason to plan to have the, the train set that we would normally expect to have running operable by sometime in June. That's what our, our goal is. Um, whether we actually operate that entire train and how often we operate it is going to be based on our pre-sold tickets, So, um, which is a great function uh, that you know, all of us who have DTS, this is something that we really value and we're going to be pushing um, pre-sales, so we have some sense of what that demand is going to be, sort of not saying devaluing walk-ups, but incentivizing pre-sold tickets so we have a better sense of demand. Um, a, a more difficult question to answer uh, uh, for us is what are going to be the expectations of the passengers who buy those tickets? In other words, are they going to want to sit every other seat? That's been something that's been proposed here in Pennsylvania that you know, a restaurant may reopen, but everyone has to fill in. You know, they don't get to sit near each other. They have to be separated. Uh, if that's the case, then a train that could normally hold 300 people is going to be holding 150. And you know, then, then that has its own implications from a revenue standpoint, how often you run and so on and so forth. Um, so our, our sort of belt and suspenders approach is to rely on our, our, our pre-sold tickets to, to judge demand. Um, follow the guidance that's coming from, in our case, the, the governor, uh, to uh, as in terms of best practices uh, for social distancing in, in operations like ours. We're also looking to what the American Bus Association is recommending to its tour buses. Um, and then um, also plan that, that, that we may not need the entire train, um, that we, we, we have a, a small uh, doodle bug, uh, we might start running with that. Um, uh, and, and sort of gradually build. Um, in, in one bit of good news, and I don't, I know for some of the folks who are participating today, the same is true, that summer is actually our slow season. You know, so, you know, we, 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 if we're going to start gradually building back to operations, um, now's a good time to do 
gradually as opposed to Christmas or fall when it's, uh, you know, the demand is so much higher. So um, in, in some, I think a phased approach, but relying on data as it comes through um, the pre-sold tickets. That's a good point. And I, I do like that you touched a little bit on, um, you know, training capacity and things like that, which I think we'll we'll dive into here in a little bit. Uh, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on the potential markets? Sure. And they are only thoughts because no one's crystal ball is working at the moment. Sure. Um, I have been following probably the political end of things in that I'm watching the to see how much pent up demand there is going to be. And that's really hard to gauge right now because as we know, things are kind of in flux and people are still very scared and in, in their homes. But little by little, I think that there's some more optimism that there is an end to this. Um, from my point of view, honestly, I'm planning on, on being maybe at 10% of what we did last last year on Memorial Weekend, and the big caveat there is if we are able to open on Memorial Weekend, I'm really planning for maybe a mid-June opening, but we'll see. If we can open, we'll open even with 10% of what we had last year because I think we need to get the ball rolling. And I could, I'm hoping that it will build a little bit over the course of the year. We're budgeting for maybe 25% of what we did last year at the last half of June and maybe 40% for July and then 60% for August. And and fall is big for us out here and that fall season starts mid September through <clears throat> middle of October. And hopefully we're at 70 or 80% of what we did last year. My big concern is is the Santa trains and and how to deal with things in the winter. So that's that's what we're planning on. I think it's from a budgeting point of view, we are being very conservative. We're planning on a 40 to 50 percent decrease in ridership this year. We're budgeting for 40 percent. I think that's reasonable, but we've got some contingencies in there. If it's if it is a 50 percent hit. And then whenever you want to talk about capacity, how we're judging capacity and, and planning on social distancing at the Georgetown Loop, I'm ready to. Sure, absolutely. Um, I do like that you touched a little bit on um, budgeting, however, though, because that is make a part of budgeting is looking into a crystal ball. And um, so you're starting to predict uh, to predict that. Um, both for Nathaniel and Mark, I just want to talk uh, a little bit about, you know, where you are at currently with, in terms of uh, canceled or planned train excursions. Um, quickly at the North Shore Scenic Railroad in Duluth, you know, we uh, are under a stay home quarantine until May 4th, but we realized that it's impossible to get up and running uh, right away the May 5th. So, you know, canceled through May 17th with the aim that Memorial Day weekend would be our first. And it sounds like, Mark, you said that Georgetown Loop is aiming for that Memorial Day weekend as well, just for something right now? Correct. Uh, Nathaniel? We're uh, currently under a stay-at-home order through till May 8th. And uh, I, I don't see us, uh, the, the governor has proposed sort of a three-phase plan with the first phase beginning May 8th. And in just looking at that plan and trying to determine where do we fall among those organizations that he's proposing can open, I think we're at the very end. <laughs> and so, you know, assuming two to three weeks for each of the phases, I don't see us getting up into operation until June. Sure, sure. Um, and that's understandable. Yeah. <clears throat> but I uh, think that, that right. brings up the importance of, of working as we can now, whether that's starting for us on May 4th or, or somebody else at the end of May, that's just making sure that, that we have all the groundwork in place. And that, that also includes policies for staff returning, making sure that you're following the, the best practices guidelines by OSHA and have your cleaning policies in place and, and really understand how you you are going to manage people coming through your venue again. There, 
on our on our part, there's there's is some confusion as to what kind of entities are allowed to open. The governor in Pennsylvania tried to be very specific in the beginning and actually listed the kind of industries uh, very clearly, and then invited people to apply for exemptions. Well, that was a <laughs> it was an interesting mess, uh, and so it's kind of this patchwork about what entities are able to be open and what are not. The, the concept of life sustaining being more elastic than what a reasonable person might think that it otherwise would be. So my intention for us has been i actually want to get some communication from the governor's office or whatever agency he's indoctrinated to help bring the state's economy back to life to actually allow us to open because i don't want the liability of having jumped the gun um, so that's sort of a first step for us the second is i want to run that by our insurance company to make sure that they know we've not jumped the gun and that they are you know, that, that if, if there is any exposure to people riding the train then subsequently saying that they contracted the virus because they were on our train and that we have something at least as a backstop that we didn't we didn't open when we weren't supposed to be open and then just as mark was, was leading into the cleaning guidelines you know uh, they're, they're absolutely important for the obvious reason but i think they are also important for the the optics uh, and messaging part that we're, we're we're taking all reasonable precautions, all industry standard expectations. And if you're looking at the, what the bus tour companies are doing, besides just the normal stuff of cleaning handrails and headrests and so on and so forth, and demonstrating how they regularly clean some of them, they're putting in you know Star Trek cal caliber uh, you know HVAC and you know, microbial cleaning system uh -huh. as well. That's not going to happen on a 1914 passenger car. Um, right. So I, I, I want to sort of understand where industry standards going to be for our industry um, before we begin to open up. Certainly, yeah. And that, that's a great point, Nathaniel. I I am going to make certain that I have for the ticket stock that we get printed this year waivers. We've got our normal liability waivers on the back of the ticket stock, but I'm working with my attorney to make sure that that we cover COVID in that as well. Plus, we will have our postings around the property saying that that basically you are waiving your liability. And if you decide to ride the train, that's unfortunately insurance is become so complicated especially this year and expensive with with two providers dropping out um, almost everybody I've talked to have has seen their insurance rates jump up considerably and we don't want to give them a reason to have to raise them again sure and also protect yourself at the same time it's a very interesting idea to think that you know your practices now can result in someone you know, catching or not catching a virus or any virus for that matter, and or just getting ill in general, and thus that can, opens up a world of liability questioning um, that we might have to explore. And this seems like could only be uh, a whole episode in itself, or a whole hour-long discussion, perhaps uh, in the future as we get a little closer. Um, if you could quick dive a little bit on the policies and procedures that um, you, you are setting in place, uh, if if you've had those conversations already in terms of beyond like well we know we now have to wipe this stuff down but uh, i think actually establishing those procedures putting them in a handbook and things like that um, at least any plans that you put together for it uh, either of you yeah, we have in in the policies written already i've got a fantastic team even though they were laid off they were still working on the policy manual and they used um, best practice from osha and and several other sources so we've got a very strict policy that's that's in place and it's probably similar to what most other businesses are doing right now so for employees especially starting out in the shop they need to keep their separation we need to make sure that there's no more than 10 people in a group up up where we are in colorado we we will have about half that most of the time uh, people have to wear masks, we're going to take their temperature. One of the big questions that we're really pondering right now is, will we make our guests wear masks? Because that's- that was a, a question real quick I want to mention from uh, David Keller, uh, who um, just brought that up here on our uh, our questions list, is um, talking about if uh, you know we should require passengers um, to, for masks to protect our own staff. And I, I, 
we are absolutely considering that and i think that we are going to if if we don't require it we're going to highly suggest that they do um, we we found masks that are available now down to about 70 cents a piece so we'll figure out if we just want to to incur that cost and and offer those as free or sell them at cost so okay. we'll see but our staff will absolutely have to wear masks it will be a, an interesting component to add that to a uniform uh, as management you know this is a, a management meeting basically about uh, our operations and um, masks now become a component of a uniform um, and thus you know need to represent accordingly which is an interesting uh, new piece of our business. The, the answer from a legal standpoint is yes, you can absolutely require them to wear masks, notwithstanding the fact there's a public health emergency issue at stake. I mean, if you're a private, fully private organization, you know, absent some sort of federal connection, uh, funding, what have you, you could you could require all your patient, all your passengers to wear red polka dots if you wanted to. You're only extending a license, and the license is on whatever terms and conditions you offer. But sure. In this instance, you don't, have, you don't have to go that far. It's, it's simply a matter of public health, and um, you know, if you require them to, if you require them to wear masks and they don't wear masks, you can, if you're, you're fully authorized, to revoke the license uh, that you've extended them, and there they sit on the platform. Um, and frankly, as we look at this uh, from today's date, I wouldn't. I wouldn't presume to even allow passengers here without wearing masks for not their own, for their protection, but for the protection of the other people who have bought tickets who don't want to be uh, uh, put in, in uh, undue danger. Um, the way in which we might ease that a little bit is to make masks available, you know, um, for the masks are cheap if you can get them, you know, and, and make them available for passengers that if you didn't bring one, we'll provide one for you, but you're going to wear one. Uh, otherwise, we'll be very happy to refund your ticket or not. Uh, uh, it also makes a good merchandising opportunity. I'm not sure I'd want my logo on a bunch of masks that remind people of a pandemic, but nonetheless, it uh, logos on all sorts of things, I guess, is it can be seen as a good thing. Sure. We're certainly a train print or something. And I think we have to err on the side of caution. And, and absolutely, we don't, I mean, from my point of view, we, we do whatever the governors and the health departments tell us we need to do. I think I think that is fair. Um, well, we have about a half hour into this, and we're about a half hour left here of our webinar, uh, brought to you by Dynamic Ticket Solutions. Here, and Mike is on board. Uh, just a quick review for everybody who's watching here: we got uh, Mark Grayville here uh, out in Colorado from the Georgetown Loop, and Nathaniel Guest from the Colebrookdale Railroad. Uh, very ambitious group, uh, always building something. And. Uh, <laughs> um, and a uh, reminder to everybody that you have a questions tab there on the, it defaults to the right of your screen, but you might have moved the window around, but uh, definitely uh, you can write in questions and comments and uh, we'll do the best to address everything as we uh, go along. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the current state. So we're all in this quarantine shutdown uh, thing. Some of us have more staff than others um, and, and crews that are working. However, um, what are some things going on right now at your business that are um, keeping the business going uh, uh, more from a marketing perspective is, is uh, what we're going for uh, in terms of your relationship with your uh, guest passengers um, i think i'll start it off here with mark if you want to uh, dabble into that sure so we have been keeping up a facebook presence and we are not focusing in on on the covid but just running some videos and some postings from from the past and we just want to make sure that our name is out there we we did have to cut the first part of the season's marketing because we usually start marketing heavily in the middle of april and since we're not opening until at least the later part of may we we obviously dropped that off. We have great relationships with our with our vendors, and we were fortunate that that the company Intercom that we do a lot of radio advertising through 
gave us more than 200 free free radio spots and they are they have been running for the last week and and basically the gist of of those spots are we're we're looking forward to seeing you when we get through this uh, come up and enjoy the fresh mountain air and our open air cars just and thanks for keeping us in mind so it's it, it's a real soft sell but hopefully it's it gives people some some optimism that that they will be able to get out again and they'll be able to get up into the mountains and that's that's probably the advertising form that we're going to follow for a while now almost kind of a public service announcement style psa kind of announcement yeah. With, and if, without telling them to wash their hands are you able to run those uh, what what market uh, in terms of relation to georgetown uh, are you able to run that in is that denver or? so yes that's in that's the front range which is all the way from pueblo up to fort collins so it's it's a pretty wide range and it covers probably just shy of four million people Cool. All right. Well, that, that's a great thing. Um, uh, we, we have a similar uh, free radio ad, ad campaign, too. Uh, stations have to fill their um, their their ad set. And uh, I think a lot of uh, advertising agencies are struggling, too, as you know, their business is, is um, so it's a good time for them to keep their business up. Um, the Lake Superior Railroad Museum, where, uh, you know, I work or whatever, is also we're, we're doing daily videos, um, video tours that are about five minutes each. And we uh, post them to YouTube and our Facebook page, which is um, supporting the Railroad Museum, which is also closed. So our railroad excursions are shut down. Um, our Railroad Museum is also closed. And we're taking the time to give little inside tours of each component. Um, I'd say about a third of the Lake Superior Railroad Museum's collection is operated on the North Shore Scenic Railroad. And it's maybe a little less than that, about 20% or something. Um, the engines and, and cars are taken out of the museum and used as part of the operating scenic railroad that we do in the summertime. So we're able to give plugs to the railroad um, excursions while also promoting the museum, which is kind of fun. And we can go inside of cabs and things that we don't normally do. So uh, I'm going to give a shameless plug that DuluthTrains.com slash video tours. You can watch those that whole series. Um, Nathaniel, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what you guys are working on out there? Colebrookdale in Pennsylvania? Sure. Sure. So initially we we were going to charge forward with our marketing campaign that advertised the uh, products we we're working on and the excursions that we we're running. Um, but with the idea that people could buy gift certificates or, or whatever for a future time uh, and reserve their spot, you know, and continue to, in hopes of having some presence online, but also some income coming in, you know, though the date the tickets could be used would, would be flexible. That seemed uh, increasingly, as the as the news became increasingly worse with, with the, the virus, that that seemed you know detached at best and, and tone deaf, you know probably more likely. And so we we stopped that uh, and um, took a look at our, what are our, our goals at this point. And and essentially they are to make sure the folks know that we're still here, and to the extent that we can provide some hope and align ourselves for that concept of hope, i.e. one of those things that isn't necessarily life-sustaining business, but one of those things that makes life worth living once once that's a, once it's sustained. Um, that was sort of the object of our marketing. And we went back and looked at our mission to see, are there ways in which we can achieve some aspects of our mission, even if they can't involve running trains? And so um, from the educational side, we, we produced a couple of videos that, uh, that, that allowed people to experience the railroad without actually being here. And ironically, uh, and I don't know whether it's because people aren't at work so they have less time to spend on Facebook or what, but we noticed that the, the reaction to this uh, was less dramatic than we would have thought. Um, so we didn't end up spending a whole lot more time trying to give people a virtual presence here. Um, we began to shift our marketing over to other campaigns that showed the value of, uh, of a volunteer-powered, community-oriented entity within the community, even at a time when its principal activity, i.e. running trains, wasn't happening. So um, we began a, a, a contest, a, a coloring contest. So we had pictures from, we had created an Easter coloring book. We put that Easter coloring book online that people could download. They colored in the pictures, and then they posted it on Facebook, and they it was a contest where they would win tickets. So. Oh. 
Uh, like like Oprah giving away the car, everybody got a ticket. So I mean, everybody won. But um, then uh, we also um, sp sponsored a campaign where people could go on to Amazon Smile and buy food products, uh, and then have the delivery address to the station, to the Colbertdale station. We filled the entire train with food, uh, and then we delivered that, or will deliver that, to local, uh, to regional food pantries. So it was a way they could do something good. We were really just a vehicle to do that. Um, it, it benefited the railroad to the people extent. That, the what's that? I'm sorry. People came to it to drop off. No, that was very important, and I'm glad you asked the question. We couldn't do that because of the stay-at-home order. Anything that would have encouraged people to come out was right. not not allowed. So. And they they order through Amazon Smile and they put the delivery address to Boyertown, Pennsylvania, the Colbrookdale Railroad Station. We load it onto the train. Uh, so, nice. um, and then we use that uh, as the we we had an, uh, we're starting this year to advertise on NPR uh, to the Philadelphia and New Jersey and Delaware markets on uh, national public radio. And rather than pull those ads all together, we we change them to to advertise this uh, food drive campaign. And so it's a way of getting the word out and, and, and reaffirming the, the value that the enterprise has to the community in a way that's different than we would otherwise be able to do. So um, I think now the messaging probably, as people are really focused on life returning to some sense of, I use the word caution, with caution, normalcy, um, you know, we're, we're gonna let let the rest of the, the world kind of come back to life in order and then as it seems appropriate begin to roll out marketing about about us i mean i don't i don't think it's a good time you know when when we're starting to open up other industries to sort of uh, jump into that mix and advertising and have that message get lost i want to come in sort of closer to the end of it um i mean it sounds like what we're what we're talking about is just brand awareness stuff during uh the shutdown uh nobody's doing any active advertising campaigns i would call it much more uh marketing and brand awareness of um keeping us in mind keeping us in the back of your head look we're still here stuff like that um and uh i think that kind of summarizes one that. of your um, questions uh, one of one of the uh, participants questions asked about fundraising when to begin doing fundraising activities again and, and i i just wanted to consonant with the, what I mentioned before about advertising for excursions, the similar message that yes, we are, we, we are, we, many of us are charitable organizations um, with an education uh, and community benefit purpose. We have our place in line, I, I think is the way in which people might perceive us. And we, we at least in terms of the, the Colbert Dale Railroad have stopped our fundraising messaging for the time being and when it seems appropriate, we'll begin to roll that back out again. Sure. Um, yeah, and I want to continue on this topic. Um, I wanted to get to uh, Alan Camp's question here. It's, uh, he's from the uh, uh, Branson Scenic Railroad, and uh, he's got a good question that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But um, before we get to that, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the cancellations. Um, I, you have both canceled excursions, uh, public excursions, right? And um, there's different different avenues you can take in terms of full refunds, uh, ticket vouchers, um, uh, cancel and walk away. <laughs> you know, there's lots of different ways you can take it, rescheduling. Um, in terms of what you set down for policy, uh, one thing that we, we tried that we really haven't done too much in the past uh, for the North Shore Scenics excursions that were scheduled for people who have pre-bought tickets is we gave a set of options to people, one of them being to donate their tickets and walk away and just donate it with the emphasis that the money that the, you bought that ticket for for the North Shore Scenic goes transferred over to the, the Railroad Museum's mission to preserve, present, and interpret the you know history of railroading. Um, and I was surprised actually how many people responded to that concept of donate and walk away. We understand it's a hard time for you too. Um, I would, you know, we didn't get a lot. We certainly didn't. But I was I was amazed how many people were willing to just walk away and, and take it as a donation, um, and then I'd say a large majority of the people that I've canceled uh, excursions on, the, the the most majority are are more than happy to take vouchers for a future excursion rather than take the refund. 
Um, so they're, they're fine with not getting your money back. They're willing to take in a, a voucher that will work for a future excursion. Uh, one of my cool tools in, in dynamic ticketing is the ability to uh, process those vouchers. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, the other option is, of course, to reschedule and then work it right to a, a refund if you really need to as your, your fourth and last option. Um, anybody have any insight on, you know, really great ideas as to best practices? Well, I, I think that you are doing what most of us will probably do, absolutely asking for for their consideration and in, in just leaving it be a donation. We have instituted for the last month 100% refund no questions asked. So if a person does want their refund, it's it's a given they'll get it. And really big thanks to Mike and DTS for not charging us on on the sales of those tickets because that makes the refund so much more palatable. So thanks, Mike. We really appreciate your your kindness on that side of things. You're and welcome. right now we are, from our point of view, we're, we've been treading water. We've been selling a few tickets, even though they're down about 97% in sales versus last year. But we've been selling about as many as we've been refunding. My, my ticketing manager is, has just started back this week. So we'll see how, how things progress if the bank account goes down more than it goes up in the next week or so. Sure. Um, anything you want to add there, Nathaniel, or we can? No, our experience is consonant with what you both expressed. I mean, we we have not been regularly issuing refunds. We've been either transferring people to a run later in the year at a time that we assume that we'll be running, um, or we've been converting the tickets into the equivalent of a voucher that they can redeem at a later time. For sure. All right. Um, I wanted to dabble into Alan Camp's question he submitted to us um, about the lobby and boarding area. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about already about our train ex trains itself with the loose idea that, you know, we'll seat people in every other seat or something like that um, and, you know, restrict the amount of space you have. Uh, we've talked about adding train cars to our consist and still reducing capacity so you have a lot more space, room to space out. But um, Alan's question, if, if this again is at the uh, Branson Scenic Railroad, which by the way is a beautiful train um, and a uh, sil silver streak line. Um, the, uh, uh, is the boarding area, how do you, how do you change a line queue uh, for social distancing when you have restricted space? Most of us have smaller uh, depots and, and boarding areas and how do you, what do you do there? Um, and uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? If you want to go first, uh, you Mark. Oh, I I just have a comment, and then I'll I'll try to give an answer as to what what we are doing. One of my absolute biggest concerns over the past month or month and a half are the numbers that people are throwing out on how many people constitute a group. So you'll see. I mean, for Colorado now starting May 4th, no groups more than 10 people. And we really need guidance on what, what the government health officials mean when they tell us a group of 10. So that is that 10 people on our property or is that 10 people who are 10 feet from another group of 10 people? Right. And, and so whenever I've taken surveys and I've, I've talked with our lobbyists and, and any communication that I have with a governmental official, I'm always asking them, please, when when you can, explain what a group is and how far apart those groups can be, because that's that in my mind is the key question. And past that, I mean, I think we're all making gigantic assumptions on on how far away we need to seat people. We've heard that every other chair is empty scenario. We've heard the everybody must be six feet away from another person. That's until we get those questions answered, it's it's really hard to set capacity and really figure out how we're going to handle these crowds. From from our point of view, we're we're very fortunate that we run that we have the ability to run an all open train or all open cars. 
We also have closed cars, which we are normally running this time of the season. But we, we're calling them the fresh air cars so that people understand that they won't be in an enclosed car. Um, we're planning on having an, effectively an usher. So we're going to load the, the group of people, whether it's a, a single person or a group of up to 10 people, we figure that they are a group that's together and we will we will sit them next to each other. If, if a family of four or six came up in the same car, we're assuming that they're going to be able to sit next to each other. And then as we go through the through the train, we're just going to zigzag from one side of the car, leaving about six feet between the groups. Um, and that will work well for us for this time in the season because we have bench seating. As far as the, the queue lines go, we're going to have a couple people working the queue lines. We've, we've got stanchions and, and ropes that we will spread out. And our, our queue line, which used to be maybe 200 people standing in a 50 by 75 foot space, now that space is going to extend a couple hundred. We're going to leave six or 10 between each group. So I think that from our point of view, our geography will allow us to, to keep people fairly separated, even though we'll still have hopefully 100 or 150 people on a train. We may go to just giving the tickets outside of the station for most of the for the people who have purchased tickets online. Or like by telephone. That's the vast majority of them. Like any tent or something? I, right, and actually, the way the way our our station is set up, we can there are old ticket windows which we can start to utilize again, where people don't even have to come into the station. Huh, that's nice. That's a nice feature. Yeah. Um, uh, I really liked the idea of potentially boarding people more of a you know you, you call their name and bring them on, and call their name and bring them on versus you know, open up the, the line queue and everybody gets on because we made a boarding call over the announcement, um, which uh, which is an interesting idea. It certainly slows the process down a little bit, but um, assuming you maybe have less people to board at one time, um, it's an interesting idea. It certainly makes it more uh, of a, intimate is a, a weird word, but you know, you're actually making a connection with each party. They get their name announced on the microphone, which is kind of cool. Um, went down that road. Nathaniel, any thoughts on uh, this topic mainly of the space in the depots uh, prior to boarding, uh, after boarding? Um, we talked a little bit about the trains itself. I think you, uh, Mark, I wanted to thank you for also kind of answering Alan uh, Wishing, oh boy, Alan Wishing Grad. Wishing Grad's question from the Whippany Railroad Museum, who was asking about thoughts on you know, how do you how do you see people on the train? Is it every other or cross pattern um, or so on? Anyway, uh, Nathaniel, any thoughts on this topic of the, the depot area? Yeah, um, we our station uh, facilities are not big enough to accommodate the principal a large number of people anyway, at least in terms of how they've been built out built out so far. Um, and so, the major impact to us uh, of not utilizing a station space that is includes space with everyone together is a hit on marketing essentially or for merchandise i should say because uh, that's where we sell all of our our uh, merchandise um but my assumption of how we're going to proceed is that rather than actually requiring people to come in and pick up a ticket they can um use their printout that they get from when they they reserve online at dts so only those folks who are coming as walk-ups will need to go into the station um we're also, uh, we've been working with DTS to um, create a reserve seat module. So uh, all of our seats are numbered so that when you buy your tickets, you'll be able to actually choose your seat on board the train. My assumption is that we're gonna block out certain number, certain seats so that we force that every other seating uh, that, that we've been speaking about. Um, and so that when passengers arrive, they know what car they're in, they know what seat they're in, uh, and then if we can do this, and I haven't rolled this out to our staff yet, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure what they're going to tell me, but uh, maybe titrating the boarding times. So rather than saying everybody show up an hour beforehand, that we, we, we have you show up at a closer interval. Um, now, obviously, some people just don't respect that, but um, 
having those boarding time sets so they're not all coming here and waiting outside at once. Our train is relatively small, so this is an easier thing to do than say, you know, sure. perhaps like Branson or wherever where you've got many, many more cars. Uh, I wanted to come back to one thing that you were mentioning there because uh, it coincides with the question we got from uh, Brando Roos from the Arkansas and Missouri Railroad, which is another beautiful railroad uh, in our country here, um, is uh, is talking about contactless check-in. Um, you know, uh, there's there's different ways that we all uh, process pre-made reservations in terms of they have to come to our counter most of the time and pick up a ticket to take to the train. Um, however, you know, obviously technology makes it possible to do other things. Um, I know that um, Mike's going to hate me for, for just announcing the concept of this, but I know he, Mike has been thinking about things such as, you know, scanners and stuff that you can take that confirmation email um, via electronic or paper and walk it right to the train. Um, Nathaniel, what you were talking about there was taking that confirmation though to get on the train. Are you exploring the world of not checking people in then um, and hitting that little check-in button or, um, you know, where are you yes. at? Yes. So, so the, the, the lack of um, importance of that, that check-in button is interesting. Um, you know, I think redemption is something that we all would love to track and, and things like that, but there really isn't anything, you know, more that you need than proof that, look, I have a confirmation email, let me on the train. And uh, here's my four people right here with me. And, and there may be other ways to do that. If you've got an all reserved seat train and you see that, you know, this, this the seat is not filled, then presumably you know that the people aren't there. That becomes a more mechanical, someone's walking around with a you know, either a, a tablet or, or um, you know, a printout from DTS or their you know, DTS system on their phone. So it's still possible to do maybe after the fact, um, but it, it may be one of those things necessary to sacrifice if you don't want to queue people up inside your station or have a tent outside or, or what have you. So sure, sure. Uh, one of the things that we try to do, and I know other railroads do this as well, is there's a, a, a car, either a car host, a trainman, a brakeman, or somebody, some railroad official assigned to every car um, and so it, it may be that we have them sort of ex post facto taking attendance, um, you know, we're checking people in as they arrive with the conductor's report. We know who's in what car and how many are in their party, that sort of thing. So it's, it's not impossible to do just for us, and I speak only for us, in the overall scheme of things in terms of all of that we're going to have to do in addition to what we're normally used to doing for uh, running the railroad now to both protect public health and also to build confidence in the public that we are protecting their health. If I have to let a few things go that I would normalize otherwise, otherwise do, i.e. merchandise or checking people in, maybe I'll have to live with that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the exit through the gift shop concept is a little bit trickier, uh, no, certainly. Um, well, we have a little under, uh, well, just over five minutes, I guess, left here. Um, we really wanted to stick with our 11.30 uh, our close up time with the thought that this conversation will continue here. But, um, um, and I want to thank everybody for, for uh, writing this with us. Reminder that you can put in some questions there in the question uh, tab. Um, defaults to the right side of your screen and feel free to, to ask any questions. We'll give a shout out as best as we can. Um, do you guys have any thoughts here? Uh, just kind of in general things that you want to make sure that we touch on for today. Um, uh, in terms of where we're at currently in the you know the COVID-19 shutdown, in terms of the out, what what you can say in the crystal ball. Looking forward here to the, the next few months. I have one comment, and that's and I hate to ask. I mean, we're all incredibly busy at the moment, and I know that Mike is absolutely one of the people that's incredibly busy. But something that might help me and probably will help our group and that's kind of knowing what the what the sales patterns are over the next few weeks and it might be a case where where we just shoot Mike an email individually and say you know, my sales are are for last week we're we're still down 97 percent or hopefully my sales last week were we're only down 80% versus last year. And then he could just maybe send out a blanket email to to the people on this on the list. I think I would feel nice, I'd feel better knowing what other parts of the country are doing, especially 
I think it'll help the railroads who are opening up a little later as well to kind of know what what the pattern is for for people. I think we're going to be one of the first to open, and we're maybe depending on the governor and the health department officials. But we're happy to share our ridership trend with this group. And again, we're just one railroad, but you know, if we're looking around at, at 12 different railroads and seeing what the patterns are, I think that that will help us as an industry budget for the rest of the season and, and kind of prepare for, for the trending. Uh, if, I think if people want to actually send me that information, I'd be happy to disseminate it and distribute it to those who asked for it. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea, Mark, that you brought up here. And then thank you, Mike, for, for compiling this. However, we end up figuring it out. I think it, it'd be really cool to be able to see sales trends. I mean, even outside of this COVID thing, and maybe there's some sort of, we opt in to share our general data to Mike, who has it anyway. <laughs> um, you know and uh is able to you know compile it in such a way that we get some sort of industrial average if you will <laughs> absolutely and i want to keep the work down for mike in my mind it doesn't need to be really pretty but just getting mm -hmm. that information out there is is very sure. helpful i wanted to make uh, two two quick points i know we're just about out of time but um i think it's very important uh, and i'm sure most everyone has but um, look into the federal programs that are out there to assist small businesses. They're, they're not limited to for-profits. They're also open to nonprofits, to sole proprietorships. They're very open. I particularly recommend the payroll protection program, as everyone sees, it's going to get another uh, boost of revenue. So if you've applied, and get funded, now's the, now's the time. Get the application and get it in the queue. It takes them about three weeks to process it. I mean, I've heard different things, but it takes about three weeks to process it. Work with a local bank to, to do it. Um, and, and keep really good records because eight weeks of the of your payroll, rent, mortgage interest, and utilities convert to a grant. That's the best program going for all of us. Uh, you can also look into the EIDL program. I definitely recommend you apply it, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. You can click a box that says, are you interested in $10,000? <laughs> click that yeah. box, you'll find that goes into your bank account and it's forgivable, uh, whether you take the loan or not. So. And that, I'm giving a sort of a summary of this, but um, look into these programs. Um, additionally, um, the other railroads that I've been speaking to, um, because we don't know what the economy is going to be like and the desire for the public to spend money, disposable income on journeys of pleasure, um, coming up with block tickets or joint tickets to other kinds of attractions in your region, um, you know, it may represent a small hit of income, but it also represents a, a boost of potential demand. So um, for us, we're partnering with um, a couple of national historic sites and places that are open air so that, that we become part of that uh, package. Thank you. Sure. And those are great points, Nathaniel. And also the FRA has put out some grant opportunities too for commuter lines and freight lines. We're, we don't apply to any of those because we're a tour, tourist railroad, but there may be some of you who do. And some uh, great information there. Um, and I, I really enjoyed this conversation, guys. I, I wanna thank you for being here uh, today. Um, this is something that uh, Mike was so kind to arrange, and I think it was really a, a good conversation and some good information to get out there. Um, I, Travis Stevenson, I, I'm sorry we're not going to get to your question today, but yours was about larger events such as Day Out with Thomas, which I think is a good one to save maybe for a future uh, conversation about uh, many of us host large events such as Day Out with Thomas that are very touch focused in terms of things for kids to do and touching things. and. Um, uh, so I think that's a good conversation maybe we can save for uh, next week. Um, uh, Brenda Roos, though, from the Arkansas and Missouri Railroad did ask uh, how many railroads were represented here. And I did want to say we had about 35 people here throughout uh, the past hour. And we think we have about 27 railroads represented, which is really, really cool, uh, plus our three here. So that, that just puts us over just over 30 different uh, excursion railroads um, throughout the country. And uh, I think we all have our own unique challenges ahead. However, as a group in the uh, tourist railroad industry, 
we're all generally fighting the same uh, the same problems. And I think together we can get a, a general idea of some other ideas and things to keep in mind um, that I'm really excited about uh, continuing this conversation. Um, I think I'll, I'll turn it over here to Mike, who will give us some uh, closing statements and we'll wrap sure. it up. I, I want to, uh, again, thank all of you for, for participating. I think this was uh, very successful. Thank you, Josh, Mark, and Nathaniel. I hope that you found this helpful and would like to encourage your feedback. Our plan is to have another session or another webinar one week from today at the same time um, and the same basic format. Uh, we'll send out another email invitation uh, later this week. Let's all try and stay safe and, and stay connected. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for attending. Hi, Mike. Hi, Nathaniel. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Thank you. Bye.